Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Aubrey Tager and you've been asked to watch this video in preparation for your next visit, which we call my best recommendation or your report of findings. So in the next several minutes, I'm going to be over, going over a condition which may likely be a contributing factor to your metabolic dysfunction known as hypochlorhydria or hypochlorhydria, however you want to term it. Now, hypo simply means less than. So we have the word hypo, which is less than, chlorhydria, which is hydrochloric acid. So less than or not enough hydrochloric acid. Now this literally means that the stomach acid and the consequences of having low stomach acid can be surprisingly destructive. Now, there are several things that can indicate the likelihood that a person has low stomach acid and one of the most common is when a person is taking antacids. Now that might not make immediate sense to you because most people who take antacids are left with the impression that they have too much stomach acid. Well, once we take a look at the physiology of the stomach and the esophagus and how they function, this should become a lot more clear. Now the following are indicators that a person may have hypochlorhydria or low stomach acid. So we'll go over those right now. Some of those indications are taking antacids, heartburn, acid reflux, indigestion, as well as offensive breath. So these are just some indications that there may be a problem. We might also have some blood lab ranges where you see an elevated BUM. So if you've seen any of this on your blood work, things like uh, elevated BUM or elevated ser serum globulin levels or decreased phosphorus, These are all indications that there may be some hypochlorhydria going on. You might also have a loss of appetite for things like meat. Now some of the other things you might notice are difficult bowel movements, a sense of fullness during or after meals, and difficulty digesting fruits or vegetables or undigested food when you're taking your stool. So you can always just go into the bathroom, take a look at your last bowel movement and see if there's any kind of food particles that are just staying in there that are totally undigested. Now if you ask the average person what causes heartburn, they will say more than likely they're going to say it's too much acid. And that's the impression that most of us are left with when we watch TV commercials selling on acids and doctors within the HMO and PPO system who are prescribing what's called H2 antagonists and proton pump inhibitors. Now these are much stronger drugs that severely diminish the body's process of making hydrochloric acid. Now study after study, especially current research, show that our stomach acid secretion declines with age. It doesn't increase. We're never going to see somebody that's over the age of 30 years old that has an increase in the amount of stomach acid. It's going to be decreasing as we get on in our age. Furthermore, when we look at the physiology of the esophagus and the stomach, the cause of the majority of those indicators that I named become quite clear. So first let's look at the stomach acid and how it's produced. Okay, so what we see here is a diagram of exactly how hydrochloric acid functions. So what we have here is the blood supply. I understand it's green and it might be a little bit difficult to see. Um, but we do have the blood supply here and we have the actual parietal cells. So these are the cells. So what happens is carbon dioxide or CO2 is taken into the cell. And when it goes into the cell, this is then going to combine with H2O or water. So CO2 and H2O, which then will yield a compound called H2CO3. 
H2CO3 is then going to break off into HCO3 or bicarbonate and H plus, which is one hydrogen atom. Now, what happens then is the proton pump will actually pull that hydrogen atom into the lumen of the stomach and it will push back or give back a potassium ion. Then we have another proton pump here that is going to bring the bicarbonate, that byproduct here of HCO3, back into the blood supply. As this goes into the blood supply, what this is going to do is this is actually going to help with the pH and lower down the pH. So we have to make sure that the pH levels are neutral as well. Normal pH is between 6.4 and 7. So if we have any problems with the lack of stomach acid or hypochlorhydria, then we're not going to have normal pH values either. Okay, so now that you have a better idea of how stomach acid is produced and that stomach production under overwhelmingly declines with age, but it does not increase at all, let's look at how the stomach acid can actually create something like heartburn or uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So what we have here is we have an actual drawing of the stomach. And what we see up here is what's called the lower esophageal sphincter, or the LES. Then we have a protective barrier, and then we have the parietal barrier over here. So, we're going to look at how this actually functions. So because the stomach has to contain the very strong acid, hydrochloric acid, it requires a barrier so that the cells of the stomach don't get digested immediately and ulcerate. So within the stomach, the body actually creates a protective barrier, mostly through mucus and bicarbonate. The whole key to understanding how low stomach acid could possibly cause heartburn, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, or acid reflux, is in understanding what current research tells us about the way that, or the one-way valve, referred to as the LES here. So this is so what we know through research about this smooth valve or, uh, are two very valuable observations. First is the mechanism that triggers the valve to close, the way that we actually close it. We currently know that it is the strength of the stomach acid measured here in the antrum that actually causes, or in the bottom of the stomach, so we have here the top of the stomach and we have here the antrum. So the pH value here is going to cause that sphincter to actually close. So second, the research has revealed that it's a physiological range of the pH needed to, to be below 2.5 or 3 for that to close. So once the food is chewed and swallowed, the esophagus delivers a bolus of food through the stomach via what's called peristalsis, or it's a rhythmic muscular contraction moving the food into the stomach. By this time, the stomach should have adequate levels of hydrochloric acid to continue the process to digest the food because everything from seeing food to smelling food to chewing food increases hydrochloric acid and gastric production. So with normal HCl, with normal hydrochloric acid production, the pH levels will drop below 2.5 to 3.0, which is highly acidic. And it is the very mechanism that causes this LES, this sphincter, to actually close. Let me restate that. It is the high level of acid measured at the antrum, down here, or the bottom of the stomach, that triggers this LES, this sphincter, to close. But when a person has low stomach acid, then the pH doesn't reach the level of acidity to trigger the closing of the LES, this LES will remain open. And at that point, whatever acid is in the stomach, even if it's not very strong, that comes in contact with the esophagus can cause damage at what you know as heartburn or reflux or gastroesophageal disease. So although there are other mechanisms that inhibit this LES from closing normally, such as obesity, bacterial overgrowth, uh, diaphragmatic dysfunction, pregnancy, among some other things, this mechanism actually accounts for approximately 80% of all heartburn that we see, as well as reflux and GERD.
Now the thing with antacids that you might be taking right now, antacids will further inhibit the body's natural ability to produce the necessary levels of hydrochloric acid. Let me say that again. If you're taking antacids, it's actually going to prevent you from being able to produce the natural levels of hydrochloric acid that you need in order for your body to function properly. So if this information is research-based and available to medical doctors and prescribing medication is worsening the root cause of the problem, then why do doctors continue to prescribe medication to further inhibit a system that's already producing low stomach acid. Well, let me just say that drugs for acid reflux and GERD generate huge, huge profits for the pharmaceutical companies. More than 60 million prescriptions were filled in 2004, and Americans spent $13 billion on acid meds in 2006. The most popular medication brought in one point, uh, sorry, $5.1 billion alone, making it the highest selling drug after, Lip after Lipitor. Okay, so I've gone over a lot of information relating to heartburn, gastroesophageal disease, and reflux. But keep in mind, these are just some symptoms of hypochlorhydria, low stomach acid, and many, probably even most people who have hypochlorhydria do not have reflux gastroesophageal disease, or heartburn at all, but they still don't have enough hydrochloric acid. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the benefits of hydrochloric acid and what it's going to do. We're going to look at what it does is sterilize the food. It's actually going to help them sterilize the food that we eat. Vitamins and minerals. It is essential to have enough hydrochloric acid in order for you to get the benefit to pull out the actual vitamins and minerals that you're taking when you're ingesting them. Because if you have insufficient amounts of hydrochloric acid, you will not be able to absorb the vitamins and minerals that you're taking. You could be just literally peeing away your vitamins and minerals and your money. Enzymes. We need the enzymes to be able to function and to break down food. Bolus motility. As we talked about before, when the food is coming down and it actually is going to be pushed into a ball and pushed down into the stomach, we need the hydrochloric acid for that as well. And last but not least, barrier health. We have to make sure that we have a barrier so that things don't get out or come in in order to disturb parts of the stomach or the water. So, having strong stomach acid levels gives us the best chance to stay healthy and free from infections like H. pylori, E. coli, hepatitis A, or some common parasites like roundworm, which are not uncommon for us to see in patients with a lot of metabolic disorders. So some infections, bacterial or viral, or parasitic within the digestive tract itself, can also be triggers or drivers in what's called autoimmune conditions, or a source of systemic inflammation. Look, a lot of the things that I see in my office are due to common systemic inflammation. We have too much inflammatory processes going on in our body and that's causing a problem here. So if we don't have enough hydrochloric acid, this is going to cause some inflammation to occur everywhere in your body. But when you have inflammation, it's not just happening in your body, it's also happening in your brain. So these Now hydrochloric acid is fundamentally required for the absorption of nutrients such as calcium and magnesium. We also need it for zinc, iron, and copper, which are other examples that depend on hydrochloric acid for absorption, as well as the vitamins C, K, and B. Now, hydrochloric acid is also responsible for the conversion of a bunch of the enzymes here that we see, which if not triggered, if these are not triggered, then it's going to lead to nutritional deficiencies because of low stomach acid levels. Now I want to thank you for watching this video and I look forward to seeing you in my office for your second visit. At that point when you do come into the office, as I have already told you, um, I expect you to be there with your spouse. The reason why I ask you to be there with your spouse or significant other is because you're making an investment in your health and what you really need to do is have the support of your loved one there with you to make sure that they understand what's going on with your health. If you had cancer or some other major problems, I'm sure that they would be there for you. This is a serious health condition that you're trying to deal with, and I expect that your spouse will be there to support. And
and we'll see you on your second visit, at which point I will give you my best recommendation and we'll go over all of those uh, recommendations for your treatment plan. And I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you for watching.